Hello, my name is Jack Stanley, and I'm the co-founder of The Tech Academy. I'd like to welcome you to The Tech Academy podcast. The Tech Academy operates a 15-week software developer boot camp. You can find out more at our website, learncodinganywhere.com. I'm really excited about today's podcast. I sat down with Nate Taggart from Stackery, and his company is a really successful Oregon startup that's active in the area of serverless technology. As a nerdy developer, it's an incredible area to find out about. I think you'll enjoy this. So I know that when you did, um, you came and talked to our students a while back, you gave a little bit of the story of like what it was like to um, just go out, hang up your own shingle and start a company and then um, get a little bit of funding and all that. But can you, um, do you mind giving you know, a bit of the story of how, how it came to be that Stackery is what it is. And yeah. Um, I'll say, and I think this is probably true of most uh, startups, is yeah. we weren't setting out to build a startup. <laughs> we backed into the, hey, there's a there's a business here. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, my co-founder and I met at New Relic. Mm -hmm. We were uh, relatively early employees there. I was the second product manager. He was one of the early lead engineers. And we worked side by side for years yeah. until the IPO. Um, you know, built a, a good relationship. He was one of the, you know, engineers I just I most wanted to work with again one day when that happened. And uh, I was this was after New Relic. I was at uh, GitHub running the data science program there, and really loved the job I was in. Yeah, you know, it was a cool cool gig. Um, was working on really fun, interesting problems with obviously very smart, talented people. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Chase, my co-founder mm -hmm. now at Stackery, he, he, uh, we, you know, we kept in touch, we'd have lunch periodically and whatever. And he, he told me about this, uh, technology he started working with, which mm -hmm. was AWS Lambda, uh, serverless, you know, yeah. and this was early days The you know, it was only maybe a year out of, out of, uh, in the market. Yeah. And. I had been playing with the same technology on the side, just kind of for fun. Okay. And we started just um, originally just collaborating. Like we we actually wanted to rebuild some of the services we had built at New Relic, but build it on Lambda. Mm -hmm. We thought it solved a bunch of interesting technical problems. And as we started down that that path, uh, we realized that it just was it was great. It was a great product, but it maybe didn't have the ecosystem that allowed it to be ready for prime time like mm. for production like no aws lambda itself aws yeah. lambda itself and it's not that lambda is not a good mature technology mm -hmm. from a technical implementation it was solid it's more about process and workflow so a, a major consideration in choosing a technology to adopt in an enterprise or any organization is you know how well supported is it how mature is the documentation around it? Mm -hmm. How mature is the, the ecosystem, the tooling around it? How does it fit into your workflow? Mm -hmm. What are the skills your team is going to have to learn to master this? And, um, you know, Lambda ticked a lot of boxes, but we realized it was really missing that um, kind of the mature operations focus mm -hmm. of how to run it in production at scale. And so these are, you know, some of the problems we saw were like, there was no deployment automation. Mm -hmm. So you're manually copy and pasting every release, right? It's not just not, that's just not sustainable. I um, mean, it's fine for the, the Hello World side project. Oh, or whatever. absolutely. And, you know, there yeah. are some, there's some little frameworks that, that are in the market that help people get started with their very first function or whatever. So there, I think there is some kind of tooling, um, but it wasn't ready for, for, you know, a new relic size yep. organization oh, yeah. to then embrace oh, yeah. it, you know? Uh, so we saw this, this automation and then around that, um, we saw a lot of focus in the market on how to build a serverless application, but we didn't see a lot of focus around how to run it, like how to maintain its health mm. and how to, um, operationalize it and how to integrate it into the other components of your application stack. And so we really, you know, focus. We found this spot and we started focusing on these problems. Can um, I break in real quick? Yeah, please. At what point along that that intellectual journey, which you described that really well, that was, that was kind of cool. At what point did you start to realize that you weren't just looking at, oh, this is missing some of this to 
oh, we could provide it? When did it turn into in your mind a yeah. business opportunity? Well, it's interesting. So uh, it's it took a long time to become a business opportunity. I think I said six or nine months of this, you know, okay. before we were really like, hey, there's a business here. I think originally what we saw was was engineering problems, was technical problems. Mm-hmm. And as engineers, we just thought we would build them, like build the solutions. Like that's what we were doing. We were building stuff. And so um, what, when we realized there was, a, there was a real opportunity here, was when we started talking to other people who were trying to use serverless and found that these problems that we had identified and the solutions we were building mm. were, you know, widely Wanted. needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we were getting a lot of really interest. Now, we had just built this, you know, prototype. We had built it for ourselves. You know, it wasn't uh, productized. Yeah. It was a technical solution. Uh but we realized, like, there's enough interest that if we did turn into a product, there might be something here. Um, but again, like, I was at I was at GitHub. Yeah. Like, I had a cool job. I yeah. was happy, um, and so I wasn't ready to like just you know leap of faith, walk away from that, and, and go do a startup. Um, so we started to test the waters. We actually um, like pretended to sell it, like you know, kind of go through the sales motions. Can we get in front of decision makers? Mm-hmm. Um, do they? identify that they have these problems um, okay. you know, of workflow and collaboration and visibility over their operation. How did you find the people who are already you know, like doing anything in this space when it's a relatively, it's virgin territory, it's, it's a new frontier of serverless, right? Yeah, I mean, and I think this is where, um, this is where it helps that we were not initially focused on building a company, we were focused mm. on building technology because there is a community around every emerging technology, yep. right? There are open source projects. Uh, we can find people on GitHub. Mm-hmm. You know, there are Slack channels dedicated to serverless. So it, yeah. was, it was not hard to find people who were motivated. Okay. What was harder was to figure out, is there kind of a commercial interest around mm-hmm. that? Are people spending money in this space? Right. Or do they Or do want they want to, to if yeah. the thing came along? Yeah. Um, so we we started doing that and and it was it was all friendly. It was through our our connections yeah. and our relationships with other engineers that we had. Um, and again, we weren't selling anything. We didn't have anything to sell yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we realized, like, yeah, there's like big companies were aware of serverless, wanted to invest in serverless, and were missing the um, the governance tools mm-hmm. and the control that they need. It's a requirement. It's a business oh, requirement yeah, absolutely. to ship software. Uh, we we decided there was something there. Now, so. had, had you guys ever had any kind of entrepreneurial explorations in the past? Yeah, so Chase and I had both separately had done a startup in the past. Um, neither of us had done, you know, a, a venture scale company. Right. And I think, uh, you know, I think, so we've raised money for this business, mm-hmm. you know, venture, venture capital. And uh, I think that... In a lot of people, that's like validation. That's like it's a real company. Right. I think you know. I think customers make it a real company, and yeah. I think there's a lot of paths to make it a real company. Uh, building a team, I think, is harder than raising money. I think yep. raising money is the byproduct of doing a lot of the other things right. Of building the team, of finding the problem, of having the relationships with customers that you can mm-hmm. turn into a business. Um, and so we backed into the raising money. The raising yeah. money was, was um, I think, came a lot more naturally than we expected it would. The hard part is, of course, um, finding problems and solutions that resonate widely and educating a market, which mm. is a new emerging technology, yep. educating people and helping separate out what's the hype around serverless and what's the reality and what are the problems and what's the day-to-day like. Right, because this isn't like a, a better mousetrap. You know, it's it's a... It's a woozle. People never heard of a woozle before. Well, totally. Oh, yeah. here's what a woozle is. You, there's a whole education step that has to be there. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, what's exciting for for us with serverless is you know we found this technology that we were excited with because mm-hmm. it solved a lot of hard problems. But uh, I think what what's been really encouraging is to just see how quickly and how broadly people are embracing this. That doesn't uh, always happen in tech. It doesn't. You know, no. a quick spike, and then it's just six months later. You're like, "Well, where'd that thing go? What was that?" Yeah, yeah. And I think we're seeing, uh, you know, we're seeing some really interesting comparisons emerge. So one of the the common ones you hear a lot about is serverless versus containers. It's mm-hmm. Like, which is going to win? Or, whatever. and we are not dogmatic about it. We think there's a 
a very real use case for both. Mm -hmm. Um, We, in fact, use both. And, uh, you know, I think most serious enterprises are going to continue to do some in containers and they're going to continue to invest some in serverless. Mm -hmm. Um, But what, what we're also seeing is this difference in kind of the adoption pattern. I think everyone's waiting for serverless to go through the same kind of slow, steady growth that containers have seen over the last Mm -hmm. five years. And what's actually happening is that there are a lot of organizations that are finding that serverless is an easier transition for them because it requires fewer new skills than containers Mm. require. And so if you can think about like orchestrating containers, for example, that's a that's something that most engineers had never thought about nope. more than five years ago. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it's certainly, it's a new, uh, you know, critical necessary piece of talent that an organization has to develop in order to do containers right, that they just don't need for serverless. And so I think what we're, we're actually seeing is that companies are kind of self-selecting into the technology that's right for them and the one that accelerates them the most. Mm. And in a lot of ways, uh, you know, serverless is easier for uptake for these big organizations. You guys find a pretty, like a, a sweet spot. We have, yeah. And and I think that's, uh, you know, it's uh, for us, it's a lot of luck. And, you know, we're in the right spot at the right time. Yeah. You know, we're not inventing serverless. We're helping companies use it well. Yeah. Um, but it lines up, you know, very well with, I think, what, what, we envision as the future of internet software. So. God, that's neat. Yeah. So your your training though, like experience and all that, it, it, it's technical, not business development, right? Like running, establishing, organizing, and running a business. Is is, is that? The well, case? yeah. I mean, I was a you know product manager at New Relic, so I did a lot of work with you know, with sales training yeah. and with, you know, interfacing with the product marketing team. Okay. And, okay. Um, so I, you know, I think we have some broad strokes understanding okay. of, of it. Um, but no, it definitely, we're stretching ourselves. It's actually, it's something we talk a lot about inside of our business. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, we're, we're good engineers and we hire good engineers. Yeah. And one of the things that I've found in, you know, over time in my career is good engineers uh, typically, there's exceptions. They come in all shapes and sizes, <laughs> but um, a lot of good engineers have, you know, they did well in school, and you know, throughout their life, they were congratulated for knowing all the things. Mm-hmm. And um, and sometimes what that leads to is people who are somewhat risk averse and who sometimes, you know, avoid ambiguity. They mm-hmm. want to have all the answers. They want to go down the path that's you know that's clear. Yeah. Right? Follow the rules. And uh, there aren't rules for a startup, or if or if there are, the rules change. And oh, yeah, yeah, there might yeah. be rules for three weeks. Yeah, then there's yeah. a new set of rules. And so one of the things that we are really explicit about, you know, in our company and with our team, is that we're all in over our heads in a lot of ways. We're all trying to figure this out. That it's okay that we don't have the answers for certain things, and that we're working together to find those answers. And we want to take the ambiguity out, but we have to be willing to like go through it. I can imagine you've got a pretty cool team then. We have an awesome team, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the advantages of working in a really fun, cutting edge technology like this mm-hmm. is that the type of people who are attracted to that work are people who, um, you know, they want to invent. They want to leave their imprint mm-hmm. on the world because there's not a collection of, you know, blogs that are showing how to do serverless right today. Right. Like we're oh, yeah. writing those. Yeah. Like that's just now emerging. The uh, and there's a great community and there's a lot of talent in yeah. the community and there's a lot of um, you know I think really uh, interesting uh, discussions and thought leadership emerging around the space and I think even different you know different branches of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's already I think emerging some different strategies of what is serverless and how do we adopt it right and how do we how do we use this technology. Uh, but at the end of the day, like we're trying to find people to plug into our business mm-hmm. who want to challenge the way that things are done. Oh, that's yeah. neat. So it's, it's cool, yeah. I'm finding some parallels in the journey we had here at the school. I, I never did work for a startup. I was always working for like the Providences and the PGEs and the, you know, the um, pretty good established enterprises. There were some smaller outfits, but <clears throat> for the most part, it really wasn't 
that wild and woolly startup thing. And I always told myself, I don't want that. I want the stability, you know, and all that. But this company was like a sit down on my kitchen table, sketch it out on paper and just dive into it. And the eventual form that it's taken is different substantially in many respects from what I initially laid down. The spirit of it is completely there. But there were so many times along the way where, like you, you, you were talking about, the rules would just change overnight. Oh, wow, we are missing a key component, and we literally have to shift the whole way we do the beginning part of our curriculum. Didn't see that coming. Yeah. You know, establishing how to sell a thing like this. <laughs> well, and when you contrast it to, you know, I, th- I think people talk about the safety of a big company, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I mean, I at least, take a very different approach. Mm-hmm. I think uh, startups are every bit as safe as a big company, particularly in our field. To be a, a, an engineer today, you can walk on to jobs pretty quickly. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of demand. And so to say, like, I'm going to pursue something that I'm interested in because I always have a backup plan. Mm-hmm. I can always go back to a big company. You are your own backup plan. Yeah, yeah. And I think the opportunity in the industry right now is, is creates a safety net of sorts. I want to take a minute to punch that kind of thing home, not because you need me convincing on the point. Obviously, you don't. But for our listeners, one of the things that I, I – recognized a long time ago is your certainty and confidence in yourself that's your greatest asset anything you can do to build that up regardless of the technical skills you have or whatever or whether you find the right you know employment opportunity you are your own greatest resource and i think it's particularly true in this industry it's probably true in, in a lot of different industries but man, i i don't know about you but like i went from contract to contract to contract i played a different game i played a jump up every single time into sure. a higher wage bracket, right? I had to make sure I could justify it and burn midnight oil learning new things. But every single time, I'm like, I'll take the risk of this six-month contract ending after four weeks, which happened a couple of times. What am I worried? Am I not, not going to get a job? Look at this industry. Look at you know what I bring to the table. Of course, you're going to get a job. I, I love that point of view you have. If you're in a big, giant IBM or whatever, the truth is you have to continually create your job every single day and put everything you got into it and know that at the end of the day, if, well, the CEO at the top, if she decides to let 40,000 people go like she did you know, in 2014, <laughs> you're going to be fine. Right. You know, But it's your attitude about it that makes it fine. And I love what you're saying because it – we really want our listeners and our students and everyone to just be exposed to that, what we consider to be the winning attitude. The winning attitude is, I'm valuable. This is a great industry to be in. Um, I absolutely will find a home. And it really, truly is, like they say in all these things about like interviewing, right? You are interviewing the place you want to get hired just as much as they're interviewing you, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I, I don't want to go off on a, on a soapbox about it, but um, I, I love hearing that that's what's worked for you because it's yeah. what I've seen to be true for myself. Well, and I think there's a there's a, another complementary side to this, which is that, um, I mean, of course, I have to pay my mortgage just like everyone else does. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, we're all, we're all, we all are in this for a paycheck. Yep. But I, I think that there's a lot of attributes to the jobs. When I look back and I look at the jobs I really have enjoyed mm-hmm. and that I was really glad I took, you know, um, they were companies that allowed me to take on new hard things and learn and stretch and grow myself. They were companies that trusted me and mm-hmm. gave me latitude yeah. and let me explore and let me screw up yeah. sometimes, you know. And uh, and I found that, you know, you can build that level of trust and you can get that level of influence pretty quickly at a, at a startup if, mm-hmm. you're, if that's your interest and that's what motivates you. And so I think that, like... For me, that's always been a form of compensation. Like I will sacrifice some amount of money. You know, it's worth twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars to be trusted on day one. Like Isn't you know, there's you, there's something you can tie to that that um, that I think will keep me coming back to startups for the rest of my life. Like I've I've found what I love now. Oh, so, yeah. love that! Yeah. Is that a neat feeling? Yeah, you know, it's it one really thing is. to be in this industry, which at least now is pretty stable in terms of employment and that sort of thing, right? Um, but it's another to find a niche in that industry that you love. Like, I started the company, but then because of the financial needs, you talk about mortgage and all that, right? I had to spend about two and a half, three years just working for other people while my business partner took the lion's share of building the business. It was about four months ago, I was able to come back and be here full time. And it's just, this is what I want to do. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you, you watch a graduate walk in the door you know when they walked in the door they were like mm, sketchy and nervous and like how's it and then they go out 
and their head is held high and they're out there and their employer loves them. I'm like, I just changed not just the one life of the student, but their family and the place that they're employed. And like, oh, come on. So I, yeah, I, I know what you mean. When you find your niche, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm curious, how did you, how did you become an engineer? Where'd you go to school? What was, the, what were the first like education and then breaking into your first few positions? What was that journey like for you? Yeah. You know, uh, I am maybe an exception to the rule. Okay. Uh, I did not go to school, uh, for engineering. And in mm-hmm. fact, I didn't go to college at all. Mm-hmm. I started, uh, my first company when I was 18 and it was a small little web development company and I didn't know how to do web development but my friends did and so my job was you know to sell it and I figured anything I could sell like you know I would take you know my percentage off of that Mm -hmm. they'd build it and you know we we were all happy Um, and I gotta say uh, you know starting a company at 18 there is no risk in that there's absolutely no risk yeah like you know, the alternative is that you're going to make, you know, $8 an hour. So like, it's not like there's, you're not giving up a whole lot and you don't have a whole lot to overcome to get back to where you would have been anyway. Um, and because of that, because you don't have a mortgage and a big car payment yet and kids to take care of yet, generally speaking, uh, that means, you know, you can, you can undercut the competition. You can. Mm-hmm. You don't have to pay yourself as much. You can. You can. You can win work. Yep. And so I think it. Um, for me, that was like that was kind of the early entry point into the industry. Mm-hmm. And I did it, of course, from a sales and marketing side, not from an engineering side. How How'd you like it? Uh, well, I. I mean, I've. I probably grew up in a generation where computers were were the norm you yeah, know I ubiquitous. computers in grade school yeah. so um so you, i think you lucky dog you know yeah <laughs> yeah i i think and i think uh you know i think people in my generation can take that for granted sometimes mm-hmm. i had a had a big leg up um i never thought of um you know how do i like computers or computer science as mm-hmm. like as an optional thing it was like how do i like cars or how do i like tvs like they're, they're just, just there. things they exist they're just they're there. part of my world yeah um but what I what I liked and what I found I really liked was this um, uh, this building, this creating from nothing, right? Uh, and that's since then, you know, I told you my career has been in product, and it was in fact it did veer into engineering, so yeah. I did engineering yeah. and product, and um, and always what's driven me is this taking seeing a problem or seeing an opportunity and building something, creating from nothing. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not handy. Like I can't fix anything in my house ever. Uh, and so like, I have no chance at all of ever building something tangible or practical. And so, uh, software was always like, virtual was, is great. Then, yeah, huh? yeah. So it's like, well, I can type, like I can handle that. Um, that's awesome. I mean, there's a backspace on a keyboard exactly. that doesn't exist with hammers. No, you know? but yeah. once it's broken, it's it, <laughs> that there is broke. Yeah. So, uh, so that's I th- and I I've actually seen a few patterns emerge. So, building, creating is one of the motivators I think for for software development. Mm-hmm. The other one is like problem solving or puzzles. Mm-hmm. Like some people like the, you know, to try to, you know, wrap their head around a pretty tricky problem and find a creative solution through mm-hmm. it. It's kind of more of a, it's kind of an analytical way of doing creative work. Yes. Right? And I, I really, um, I've seen people who, who uh, even if it didn't come naturally, even if this isn't how they started, people who find a passion for creating mm-hmm. or people who find a passion for the problem solving, which a lot of times means looking at problems that they can't figure out and like working at it for a long yep. time and like choosing to do that. Those people I've seen really can go very, very far in this field. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's such a, uh, I think those are kind of the core native ways of doing software. I, I, I observe the same thing. I, I look for people who um, can hold a mental model in their head mm-hmm. and put that mental model through state changes. Now, I really sound like a nerd, right? <laughs> but, but they can put it through state changes and roll that back and forth through time and see if I go down this branch, what's the state of that look? Oh, never mind. Roll back. Right. And they can, yeah. You know? Yeah. Kind of step through the logic. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and the mistake I made when we first started the school was that um, I thought that was just a thing that certain people have and some people won't because I thought I had it, you know, just natively. But... In, in developing the curriculum, I spotted that I 
didn't have that. And in fact, it was a couple key things for my parents, um, most notably a magazine that came out in the late 70s through mid-90s called Games. Games Magazine primarily was all about different board games and this, that, and the other, right? But they always had these logic problems in them. And I would devour those things. But the things when you're looking at them on the page, yes, there's a mental model you have to hold in your hand, but you're looking at something represented in mass. You're seeing the different pieces of parts of it visually. And doing those over and over again, I was able to take and create a mental picture in my head and make that jump. But it didn't come naturally. So when we hit this section of the curriculum where we're trying to teach people how to think like a software developer, we try to have them lay it out in mass in front of them as much as possible, as often as possible, and use that as a learning tool. And eventually we find that a lot of the the people who really excel get to the point where they're holding the whole mental model in their head. Yeah. But you have... it's a way of thinking that isn't natural, and you have to right. inculcate it in people. Well, and then I think that that leads to what I found is a common mis- misconception about software is mm-hmm. people think like, you know, that there's some aptitude that they need to have and walk on with or something, mm-hmm. or that you know, it's like, oh, I have to be good at math or something. I've seen people tell me that like um, they didn't have what it took to do software while they're filling out a Sudoku puzzle, and I'm like, you just <laughs> no, fundamentally don't it. understand what software is because. That's what it is. It's that. Yeah. It's this the same steps of reasoning you're going through right now in your head. Oh, it's yeah. write that down. Oh that's yeah. All it is. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, what? What? But yeah, it's make, help, what, helping people to make that jump and that leap is just well, that's yeah. that's our joy here. And the the anchor, I think, the realization that that people need to come to is that every single person who starts with software does not know how to do it 100 percent of them it's a it's a you know it's a hard scary intimidating thing and then you you learn the basics and it's like oh that was was actually super easy Ah. and then like every step beyond that is is literally just extending what you know one more one more layer you know well our podcast listeners are lucky to hear that from you can you also punch that up when you talk to the students (laughs) i'll be glad to hear it it's the thing we reinforce all the time but for them to hear it from um, a successful software developer or engineer or business person or whatever out in the, in, in the environment, it just it reinforces it for them, you know? And it's so easy after years in and around the industry to just take these things for granted, but that that's an important piece of wisdom that you probably learned over years. That like, no, that's... Totally. That was yeah. not, it was not a freebie. Like, no. you learned that the hard way. Not I think all. everyone does. And yeah. what I found is the people... You know, that I've worked with some of the best engineers in the world, you know, top 1% engineers Mm -hmm. consistently still doubt themselves and still go through this. Like it's not, it's, yeah, it's not a, it's not unique to you wherever you are and whatever stage you're at. Like that's just part of it. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. People, I, I rarely consider like, what do people think of me? You know, like (laughs) whatever. Right. But I mean, at the school, I am the senior technical resource. I am the software developer with years of experience and when it comes Here's the thing is, any problem anybody ever walks up to me with in the school of any nature is usually solved within five minutes. So I have the idea maybe that there's like, well, man, Eric knows everything. Oh, no, you have no idea. The number of things I don't know would, wouldn't fill it, would fill up an earth calculator and keep on going. You yeah. know? But it's because I know that and I'm not afraid of it. And it's like I'm willing to just dive into anything. That's what we want to you know, create in people It's like. No, you are your own greatest resource and your own natural curiosity and drive to solve problems is that doesn't matter whether you know all the exact right technical things. Yeah, well, and kind of circling this back a little bit, uh, you know, if the best engineers are comfortable with that level of ambiguity and they, they embrace that and they dive into that and you look at some of these emerging computer science fields like, you know, serverless applications, mm-hmm. for example, uh, the people doing this kind of cutting edge work that are clearly great engineers, the reason they're great engineers is that they're comfortable not knowing. It's okay to them that there's no one they can ask to figure this out. They'll just you know, keep chewing on the puzzle until they get it. And that, that kind of not giving it up, that's what moves the industry forward, I think. I love that. And, and by the way, I, I do want to validate you. You are in an area that um, to one degree or another is actually moving the industry forward. And um, I envy you that experience is really, really cool. Right. It's really fun, yeah. Yeah. We're creating yeah. the graduates that will be working in those areas in the future. And so I know that we're doing we're doing something for the industry. It was part of our motivation. We, we really do want to uplift the industry. But there's the people, the human capital part of it, right? Yeah. But then there's what, you, you know, what people like you are doing where you're like, I'm going to quote unquote take a risk, 
but as you so adroitly pointed out, it's not really that much of a risk. But I'm going to dive into that that terra incognita, that unknown country, and I'm going to report back everything that I find. And I know that five years from now, either this technology won't even be used or it'll be vastly morphed and changed, but my work could be of great value. And I have fun doing it, you know? Yeah. And it's just, it, it is neat that we live in such a new industry. 40, 50, 60, 70 years of an industry is really new, sure. you know, that we could, we could do stuff like that. No, you know? absolutely. And I think like, you know, I, I'm driven to serverless. That's the, that's the one I like. But there are, there are a hundred other cutting edge parts of, of uh, computer science. Mm-hmm. Like I told you, I came out of data science, you know, yeah. AI, ML, there's a lot of really fun uh, stuff happening in that field right now yep. too. So I think like, you know, you find that the part that resonates with you and then you go to the part where you don't know. Yeah. And like, that's it. That's the formula. Yeah. Just do that and you will go really far. So. Man, you know, we've been getting, we've had this phenomenal luck with um, who we've been getting on the podcast and like the unbelievably dynamic, um, you know, personalities, wonderful viewpoints. This is one of my, my favorite interviews we've had in a while. I really appreciate what you're doing. Great, thank you. Um, and just your candor in it. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, this is Jack Stanley again, co-founder of the Tech Academy. I'd like to leave you with a suggestion. We call this Jack's Random Tips. Today's tip is arrogance and confidence. I'm sure this could be made into quite the debate, and it's a matter of viewpoint and opinion, really. Personally, I consider confidence to be a highly valuable trait, but I can't stand arrogance. So how do they differ? Well, arrogance is defined as an exaggerated idea of one's level of importance. And confidence is a self-assurance due to appreciation of one's abilities. But I like to think of arrogance in terms of how a person treats others. An arrogant person looks down on other people and can treat them poorly. Instead of holding the door, they expect the door to be held for them. It's almost as though they need validation on their status from others, and when they don't receive that validation, they express upset. A truly confident person doesn't need to be told they're competent. They know that already. They can stand tall without the need to plant their feet on the backs of others. There was a time in my life where I observed arrogant people that were very successful, and so I attempted to emulate their behavior. It always felt unnatural. I finally realized that arrogance had nothing to do with their success. It actually hampered it to some degree. Arrogance and success are two completely separate entities which do not contribute to one another. True, there are people who will let you push them around in life, and true, Such people can be taken advantage of. But who wants to work with people that secretly despise them? There's nothing wrong with being confident. Just treat others well in the process. A job well done? Pat yourself on the back. Think highly of yourself. Believe in yourself. Confident people are certain. They know they're right when they're right, and they're not too arrogant to admit when they're wrong. I think confidence has gotten a bad name because some people have mixed it up with arrogance. I hope this has shed some light on this issue. As the saying goes... Confidence smiles, arrogance smirks. And again, if you are interested in enrolling in our software developer bootcamp, please visit our website, learncodinganywhere.com.